Hi, my name is Tal, and I'm the Educational Director at the American Academy of Functional Health, where we help practitioners learn about the root cause approach. So many of you have been asking us, how is functional medicine different than primary care or standard of care? And how does it work, essentially, right? Do we really dive deeper to understand the root cause of chronic condition? And so in today's short video, I wanted to talk a little bit about functional medicine's approach and how is it different, how it could function together, be integrated into primary care or be used by itself to find and understand what's driving the disease pathway. I'm also gonna give you a really cool example of how you can treat patients, for example, with diabetes type two with the functional medicine approach. So let's dive into it. So I'm gonna create this little chart here. And on the left side, I'm gonna put in primary care. On the right side, I'm gonna put functional medicine. So I would say the biggest difference is in primary care, the provider focuses on the disease or the symptom. So we try, they prescribe medication typically to address the disease, manage the disease or address the symptoms. Right. While in the functional medicine approach, the provider tried to look at the patient and the root cause. So we're trying to understand, we're trying to look at the whole picture and trying to understand what is it that is driving, right? What is driving these symptoms or conditions? Another difference that we're seeing in the two approaches is that in primary care, the main tool that is used is drugs or surgery. While in the functional medicine approach, we mostly use nutritional, clinical nutrition, herbal compounds, and lifestyle changes. There are also nutritional compounds that are very specific and have very ph specific physiological impact, but this is a more natural approach to the drugs and surgery. And again, what we're focusing on is finding what is the root cause and eliminating it by modifying our environment, our lifestyle, our diet, our, or adding nutritional compounds to create a certain physiological impact that will affect, will change the root cause. The result of all of this is that with the drugs and surgery, you're typically, you're just typically managing a certain condition. You're not actually treating the condition. Now, some of you might say, oh, but, but I'm getting metformin for my diabetes and that's supposed to treat my diabetes. But it's not treating and it's not curing because the moment you stop taking the medication, your diabetes is going back to being out of control, right? So what you're essentially doing is you're controlling diabetes, right? So this is managing or controlling, right? So if I have a leak in my roof and it's raining and the water are coming down, it's dripping down into my living room, I can control it, right? By putting a bucket underneath the hole and in that way, I can control the water leaking into my house. But this, as soon as I take the bucket out, my house is gonna get wet, right? Because I have not addressed the hole in the roof, which is the, which is the root cause of this, this issue. Here, on the other hand, with functional medicine, we're not trying to manage or control the situation. We're trying to understand what's causing it and fix it, fix or correct the problem. We're also focused on health optimization. So we want our patients not just managed, but we want them their, their health to improve. This translates into a better quality of life, but also healthier life and healthier function, which reduces the risk of this patient developing other conditions down the road. So this is just an overview of the differences. And let's dive into an example from diabetes, right? So we know that diabetes type two has two problems, right? One is there's not enough insulin. There's not enough insulin to, to activate the cells, to start uh, utilizing the sugar that we're eating. So the sugar remains high. The second thing is insulin resistance, right? 
there is insulin. There's some insulin, or maybe you're injecting insulin. You already got to the point in which your medication metforming are not enough. So you're now injecting insulin, but the more the insulin resistance increase, the more insulin they need. So essentially, if we provide the patient with, with the drug, or if we provide them insulin, we have still not addressed the problem, which is the insulin resistance. This is one approach, and we know that this is unfortunately not the optimal or ideal approach because many of these patients continue to progress down the disease and develop cardiovascular events, loss of function, that could be liver or kidney or eyesight. They develop neuropathy. This is up to 60% of patients with diabetes develop these complications. And then now they're calling dementia, diabetes type three. Why? Because the same mechanisms that cause damage here are also causing damage to our nerves. And when that happens in, this, in, our, in our brain, in our central nervous system, you get dysfunction, you get dementia, you get loss of cognitive abilities. And so we can see why just putting a patient on a drug and sending them home is far from being ideal and far from really providing the service that they need in order to address the diabetes, right? And also preventing all of these and making sure that they are functioning healthier and have less risk of developing other conditions down the road. So let's take a look at how the functional medicine approach will look at diabetes. Now, the question that a functional medicine practitioner utilize is what is actually causing diabetes. In our functional and nutritional medicine certification training, you learn specific strategies, nutritional strategies. You learn about nutrition. You learn about herbs. You learn about lifestyle adjustments. And you learn about supplements that could be useful for patients to treat and address diabetes in a natural way. So we, we teach you all of these. We teach you the treatment protocols, the evidence-based approach. You learn about all of this. But most importantly is to understand what's actually driving this disease. Because if we can address it from the root cause, then we can prevent other conditions from, from forming. Let's take a look at three examples of what is, uh, was found and reported in studies to drive diabetes. And we've used the same approach to help treat patients, multiple patients with multiple conditions, right? But let's just talk about diabetes. So the first one that we're gonna take a look at is secondary mitochondrial dysfunction. Take you back to the pleasant or unpleasant memory of biology one-on-one. -on -one. Essentially, the mitochondria is the organelle inside our cells that takes glucose and oxygen into the cell, inside the cell, and it's got these beautiful ridges, and it processes it processes those two, it oxidizes, it burns that glucose and produces energy in terms of, that is referred to as ATP, molecules of ATP. And this is what every cell and every organ in our body uses, like our muscles, right? So essentially we're taking, every time you eat a sandwich or you eat pasta, you eat potatoes, you eat anything with carbs, your cells, are taking in signal from insulin to get into the cell where they are burned and oxidized to create molecules of ATP. That's in a nutshell. Of course, it's much more complex and I'm oversimplifying this process, but it's essentially what we're burning the way that we're burning sugar. But if you have a dysfunctional mitochondria in your cells for multiple reasons that could happen, but if you have a dysfunctional mitochondria, then now you're eating 
you're eating glucose, you're eating carbs, sugar level goes up, and sugar goes into your cells, but this energy factory is no longer functioning. The result, the sugar cannot be processed, right? If the sugar cannot be processed, guess what happens to the sugar levels in your bloodstream? It remains high because your cells are losing the capacity now to process those sugars, to oxidize and burn that sugar and turn it into molecules of energy. Not only that, but with mitochondrial dysfunction, you also get reactive oxygen species, which is, in other words, it's, it's referred to as free radicals, which cause damage to your cells. Environmental chemicals. There are estimated over 50,000 chemicals in our food, in our water, in our environment, released into the air from, from paint that was in our house 20, 30, 50 years ago. Uh, there's chemicals from smog, from cars. There's so many chemicals around us, but if we just focus on one, just one of the main one, we'll talk about BPA. BPA is really interesting. We're all exposed to BPA. Some surveys report that we're exposed to about three grams of BPA every week, which is the equivalent of a credit card right and bpa is basically found in plastic bpa can be consumed mostly through drinking water through containers like plastic containers or if you store food in plastic containers so bpa is very unfortunately very common uh, we're all exposed to it and bpa does two really interesting things bpa in animal study was found to lead to over secretion of insulin from the pancreas. So they took animals, they injected BPA. Every time they injected BPA, the pancreas start producing a lot of insulin. What they found is that over time when they do this, they fatigued the pancreas and the levels of insulin started to reduce, which means, right, that we're losing our ability of our pancreas to produce insulin that is so needed and is a part of pathophysiology of, or the development of diabetes, right? So BPA can cause changes and damage to your, your pancreas. In human studies, higher amounts of BPA were found to be associated with greater insulin resistance and abdominal fat. So essentially, according to these studies, the more you're exposed to BPA or, or the, long, the longer, right, it's the level of exposure plus how long you're being exposed to it, the more you develop insulin resistance and abdominal fat, which means that, and unfortunately, we're all exposed to BPA in certain levels, right? Some of us, our detox systems work better, some of us less, some of us are exposed more to BPA, some of us less, but this is another factor that unfortunately doctors don't talk about. And then the third factor that can lead to uh, diabetes is gut microbiome or loss of integrity. If we have more bacteria in our gut than we have cells in our body, right? So it's a whole ecosystem. Think about this whole jungle, like the Amazon, which is have all these multiple different species of animals, right? So in the same way, we have multiple species of bacteria and each of those bacteria that we have in our gut is doing something a little bit different. Some are helping us to create nutrients. Some are helping us to metabolize food. Some produce byproducts like uh, short chain fatty acids which are helpful in reducing inflammation, right? But some of those are inflammatory or harmful or imbalanced pathogens or bacteria, right? So there's actually an interesting study that showed that certain people, when they have a higher amount, if you have a higher amount of a certain bacteria in your gut, you are much more likely to develop diabetes because those bacteria could interfere with your ability to process and metabolize uh, glucose properly. One of those bacteria is called flavoneurophilus. 
Flavonifractor species. So Flavonifractor is a species that was found in research to be associated with diabetes because it alters the metabolism of glucose in our body. There's certain mechanisms in the way that it does it, and that's what we study in functional medicine. Like, what are the mechanisms? How does this impact the gut? How does this impact your endocrine system and your hormones? How does this impact your nervous system? How does this impact your glucose metabolism? That's exactly what we focus on in functional medicine, understanding the root cause, understanding the connections, and what's actually causing diabetes. Now, if you just have a patient that just takes their diabetes medication, then you have managed the patient's condition. Hopefully, for now, it's managed, but we have not addressed the root cause. We did not address the root cause, which are, I shared with you three causes, environmental factors, the gut, there's also inflammation that was found to contribute to diabetes. The more inflammation you have, the more inflammatory cytokines you have. Studies are showing that you have a higher risk of developing diabetes. So, essentially today, when providers are telling patients that they are sick, because it's their genes, that's not entirely correct because the signs of epigenetic are showing us that it's not our genes that are necessarily determining our destiny. It is what we do with those genes and what is it there that trigger those genes like an on and off switch. So you can change your health and you can change the health of your patients by understanding the root causes. And you can also make straightforward, simple recommendations in terms of their nutrition, herbs, lifestyle, maybe a couple of supplements in an evidence-based approach to treat their chronic conditions. Diabetes is just one example, but we have seen patients with multiple conditions joint conditions, chronic pain, degenerative conditions, neurological conditions, endocrine conditions. We've seen patients with autoimmune conditions. We've seen patients with multiple conditions that have reversed, that have went into remission, that have improved their function and their quality of life just by addressing the root cause. We know that we, you can do it. We can teach you how to do it. We have a whole system in place and everything is self-paced. So if you're interested in learning more, reach out to us. We'll be happy to share about our functional medicine or our nutritional medicine programs. We're very clinical, we're very practical, we're very straight to the point, right? So I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope it was helpful to kind of think about different concepts, to expand your understanding of chronic diseases and how to treat them and reach out to us. We'll be happy to answer your questions. We'll be able to continue the conversation and help you to improve your health, your family's health, and your community's health. Thank you for watching and take care.